Hello. So welcome to this session. This is a uh, network automation using unified API. I'm Stuart Clark. I work for Cisco DevNet as a network uh, automation advocate. So let's talk about our game plan and the agenda today. I'm going to go through starting with APIs. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, how did you start with APIs? Why did you start using APIs? That's another question that I got asked. Why did you stop with the command line and move to APIs? How did you get into automation? So I want to check that one off first. The next one I want to go to is uh, goals, hopes, and dreams. And that's pretty much going into learning network automation and APIs is what I had in mind. An exciting time and a great ride. Then we're going to move into uh, Napalm and why I chose Napalm to start working with. What excited me about this and what will excite you guys about working with Napalm as well. We'll look at the platform installation and support where, and the usage, where you can use this, where you can't use this. Uh, we'll look at it, then we're going to look at it in action and see some actual demo time. We're going to see Napalm in action and how you can contribute to this. Every single one of you here can contribute to this, which is fantastic and it's one of the reasons I love the open source community. So starting with APIs, I run this ginormous footprint, really, really big. 40 data centers, 6 million customers, a terabyte and a half of data a day, uh, more clicks than Google and Facebook put together, going through URLs, passing through there. My configurations were getting huge. They were sprawling. Um, I was reaching limits on bandwidth, on ASAs. I was reaching throughput limits on routers. I was maxing stuff out, which is great. It means you're doing well because customers are buying the products and it means there's more people subscribing to your service. But there's the downside to that. There's the managing of this. Just because you're doing 4 million customers one year and then the next year you're doing 5 million customers doesn't mean you get double the amount in staff. Nobody has that kind of headcount, that kind of budget. You're lucky if you get one contractor or something else. So you have to find a way to get your teams to be more streamlined, more agile, and get them, get them moving, get your deployments and your projects all lined out a lot quicker. So I'm sat there at my desk one day, and I'm talking to one of the SRE guys, and I'm making a change on some ASAs. And I had around 250 ASAs, all in um, either cluster or HA mode, all across the word, world. And what we was doing was, because of this success, we'd had to put multiple pairs of ASA into each site, each of the 40 sites. So in some cases, we had six pairs of ASA load sharing traffic across the ASAs. And what would happen is we're running these ASAs, and I'm thinking 55, 85 SSP 60s. And we're putting almost 25 gig TX through these devices. And if you read the document, they actually say 18 gigs. So we're running these things pretty hard and pretty heavy. And there comes a point where you're redlining them at around 80%. And if you know the ASA model and you're running dynamic protocols on these, when you get to 85%, trust me, OSPF and ERGRP adjacencies will fall. They will drop. That's the first thing that's going to go. And then after that, the whole thing will just drop. And that happened a lot. And so what we had to do was we had to dynamically shift the traffic. When this ASA is starting to get warm, we have to shift the traffic to one of the other pairs in the data center to actually compensate for this and bounce the traffic along. So what that meant was, was picking up a bunch of access lists, a bunch of static routes, and then moving them from one set of ASA to another. Sounds complex, sounds crazy. Yes, it was. Doing that during the day is really difficult, especially when you're dealing with granular ACLs and slash 32 routes, and you're doing redistribution with OSPF and ERGRP and such like. Doing it when somebody calls you at 3 in the morning after you've worked a 12-hour day? My friend here is nodding because he knows what I mean. It's difficult, and you really have to have that really fine granular OCD to be able to get that right. Because otherwise, you're going to black hole customer routes. And we're trying to catch this before the customer notices. As soon as we get the thresholds, we start moving the traffic. The last thing the customer wants is a black hole. The traffic comes in but doesn't go back out, or the traffic doesn't even make it there in the first place. And then the customer calls, and nobody wants that. So I'm sat with my SRE guys, and the SRE guy says to me, these new ASAs, the ASAs that we've got, do they have an API? And at that point, I thought API was a type of lager. 
It is. Right. <laughs> I said, yeah, it does have an API. And he said to me, if you can enable that API, we can automate this process. And my SRE guys who I work with are masters of automation. I learned so much from them. And they said, enable the API. And so we did. And after we did this, he said to me, and he walked away from me, and he said, don't worry about the firewalls anymore. We can automate them and take care of them. And I'm thinking, am I handing over my network now? Am I handing my firewalls over to the SRE guys? Am I out of a job? No. So what I said to him was, how about a mutual trade? I know ASA. You know APIs and automation. Let's swap it over. Let's trade. And he was really happy with this. He was really, really happy with this. So I, he said, come with me. So me and this guy, we walked across into the SRE area. And of course, as soon as you walk in, a network engineer walks into an SRE area, it's like meerkats. Because they panic. They think that something's wrong. They think that you know, you, you, they, the SRE guys have either made a mistake or they're causing an issue on the network. Or you've gone over to tell them there's an outage. But that wasn't the case. I went over there to learn from them. And this is when I call this going over to the dark side. And I started spending 50% of my days sat with the SRE guys so we could learn how to automate ASAs, how we could make this process so much more better, how we could stop this happening, this 80% threshold from kicking in and the whole panic kind of setting across the business unit because we think we're either going to one of the ASAs is going to crash or you know, the customers are going to notice. We're, we're trying to find a way out of this. And that's when I realized, have I seen the future? And I think for me, that's when the penny dropped. That's when the penny dropped for me that network automation was the best way to move both my career forward, move our network deployments forward, move forward all of our ads, moves, and changes and also to implement a source control and version control so we can track everything across the network. If you're asking now, okay, what does this have to do with unified APIs? I went back to my desk after working with the SRE guys and I defined the strategy. I defined a strategy of how I wanted to move forward with network automation. And I brought up my goals and I brought up my non-goals. And I mentioned source control and infrastructure as code I uh, talked about initial provisioning and management and operational co correctiveness, getting all the templates right, removing all the snowflakes from the network and making sure that everything was perfect across the board. The non-goals were, I didn't want to remove access to the CLI because if you're troubleshooting a, a line card issue, I'm yet to see anybody do that with automation at a really great level. Packet loss on a line card where the line card needs altering or the route, certain routes won't go out or something like that on an XR device out to the internet or something's being black holed. One of these issues you can't put your finger on and you work through it, taking a lot of captures, looking over a lot of information before you see the root cause. So I was never going to shut myself out from logging into the device. And I didn't want to use any proprietary software because I'd gone to the business unit and I said, I want to start automating. And the first thing they said to me was, how much is this going to cost? So I had to figure out a way of doing this for nothing, just time. So before I go into the answer to that one, this is one of the things that come up. And I don't know the author who said this, and I read this about two weeks before I came to Cisco Live. To air is to human. To propagate errors at massively scale is automation. You don't want to be that person who goes to your boss and says, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is I took down the network. The good news is I did it with automation. You don't want to be that person. So I started working with a different team within Cisco. Cisco is made up of lots and lots of different teams. And I started working with a different team who had gone through this transitional period like I had and our team had a few years before. And they'd automated their network at scale. They'd done everything the same way, fighting fires, you know, the finger-defined networking, you know, hammering away on the CLI kind of thing all the way through. And they introduced me to this beautiful Python library called Napalm. I'm going to try and say it without taking a breath. 
Napalm stands for Network Automation and Programmability Abstract Layer with Multi-Vendor Support. Try saying it 10 times fast. It is a Python library that implements a set of functions to interact differently with network devices operating systems using, an API, using a unified API. And this is great stuff. This actually means is that those devices which don't have a unified API, those old dusty sort of iOS routers and uh, iOS switches and things which don't have an API, which no one wants to spend the budget on to upgrade, that you don't have an API and are never going to have an API, because the code is old on them, you can start automating using automation with a unified API. So that means that you can use your latest and greatest devices, such as Nexus, which has the NX API, XE and XR, and then you can get your older devices as well, and you can run the same automation across all of those with the unified API. OK. That's pretty cool. And here I want to talk about hardware abstraction. And you see there I'm listing two other vendors. And I'm in a situation where I'm predominantly this vendor. And then, does anybody here work at MSPs? A lot of companies don't go so much organically nowadays. They go out and they buy other companies. Now, let's say that I built all of my automation just for Cisco, when my CTO is out there with his little shopping cart buying up companies, he doesn't go down to the network engineers and say, oh, by the way, before I buy this company, are you all using Cisco? No. They might be using this vendor, or this vendor, or this one and this one, or that one and that one, or all three. But you can guarantee that once that merger has taken place, your boss or his boss is going to say to your boss, that great network automation that your network engineers do here, I want that to work here. And I want that to work here. Because you guys have had so much success over here with this. What's the difference, right? They're just routers and switches. OK. So the great thing about Napalm is it does all the heavy lifting for you. And you don't have to worry about whether you're using an XE device, an XR device, a Nexus device, a Juniper device, or an Arista device. Doesn't matter. All the data is going to come back the same and look the same. With Cisco, we have XE and we have XR. And I started with plain vanilla iOS. And then I moved on to XE, which was kind of similar. And then I did Nexus, few changes. And then I learned XR. Wow, that hit me like a train. I make my commands and I try to exit and it's saying, no, you have to commit first. I'm like, commit? And then I learned this vendor and I didn't sleep for three weeks. And after that, I didn't want to even try the one on the end. But I've been in the situation where you've got that mixture of legacy and the different platforms, the different CLIs. And then we've been throwing the curveballs by having the other vendors pushed into us. And being able to abstract that data and have that single layer of abstraction across so it doesn't matter which device you're looking at, you can configure it, you can pull information back from it, adds, moves, changes, great, doesn't matter. Because when your boss or your CTO says, we need to upgrade things, he just says, we need to move packets from here to here or we need this bandwidth from here to here. And he gives you $1,000, or he gives a budget of $1,000. He doesn't care what vendor you're using. Only a certain or small amount of people choose the vendor, correct? Usually the engineers and the architects. They choose the vendors. And why shouldn't we be any different? Why should we care what device we're configuring at the end of the day? That should seem seamless to you and I. It shouldn't matter which vendor or, or which platform we're working on. Automation should help us solve it and break down those barriers of the different things. And when I mentioned moving packets before, these are some of the typical things that we want to configure. Our network protocols. The first project that I undertook was setting up BGP peerings. We had a huge, massive... Um, peering network globally, every peering we was peering with, moving quantities of traffic across here. 
And if any of you have ever worked with uh, peerings and things like that, and you're on peering DB, uh, you attend Nanog or LoNAP or, or Ripe, or you attend Lynx or something like that, or many of these peering forums across the world, doing peering can be a full-time job. You have requests coming in, and then you have you know, uh, password changes and things like that. And then Apple comes across to you and says, hey, by the way, we've got 20 peering sessions across, you, across the world. We're changing our AS number. And then you have to make that change happen across all of those devices. And that was the first thing that we undertook with automation and Napalm, was building and tearing down BGP sessions. So then the next thing we looked at was setting up links and building further configurations. As we expanded our footprint in the data centers, we want to bring up new links. We want to bring up port channels, new interfaces. We want to bring up new VPNs as well. And we might want another carrier. There's been plenty of times where I've got one, say, a, a 10 gig single feed to level three. And we're doing so much traffic on that that we've gone out and bought another 10 gig to aggregate that into a port channel. And I want to build that up with automation. I want to add that other port in there. And I don't really want to log into the router to do that. I want my automation to take care of that for me. So these are just some of the things that you kind of pick out, which become your sort of daily process. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're on an XE device, it doesn't matter whether you're on an XR device, that process then becomes the same. As we know, the configuration is slightly different, but now that we're using automation, we don't care. We don't have to care. We just have to say, take this port, add another one to it, create the port channel, thank you very much. BGP session is good, port channel's up, traffic's good, everyone's happy. So talking about the mixed uh, vendor things, what I'm showing you now is the Napalm support matrix. And it doesn't stop here. There is a lot more vendors in here. But you'll see there is a little bit of sort of difference between all of these which we have. And I've really highlighted the kind of the big six, the ones most people are familiar with. And you can see here that they have different driver names, that's how they identify themselves. The way the data is presented, is it structured data, is it unstructured data? And then the minimum versions you have to have to make this work. And then the back-end libraries here. There's a little caveat at the bottom about the NX API 5K, 6K, and 7K families, which was used in 7.2 NXO. The SS driver is supported on there. And this is the nice thing about Napalm, is that when with Juniper you're using NetConf, but with Cisco you're using SSH, and then with Nexus, you can also then use the uh, NX API. And that provides the connectivity into that device of how you're going to connect to it. But again, we don't need to really care about that. All of these things are generally open to us anyway. We're used to using SSH in our networks. We're used to using NetConf. And we're also enabling the NX API, the, kind of the future of you know, networking and things now. That's a simple enablement. But if you didn't want to go down that route and enable NX API, you could always go in via the SSH because you've got the support for it. How do you install it? Really, really simple. It's published to PyPy. So you just have to do a pip install. There's a couple of caveats around the pip where different pip versions have had trouble installing it. But that's typical of some Python, uh, Python modules and libraries. So if you ever see the issue of installing it, just check the pip version that you're actually using it. Here you'll see that when we've done the pip, you'll see the Junos here, PyNSO. You get TextFSM, and you get Ginger2. The reason why Ginger2 is there as well is so that you can template this, and you can use variable files and template out all of your things. And that's kind of expected. I think when the devs were doing the relaunch of this, they actually included Ginger2 in there because they thought that that's the most common thing that people are going to do all of their templating with. So what can we do? We're going to talk about two things here. We're going to about getting data and configuring data. But there is two slight variations when we start to do our configuration. We have configuration replace, which replaces the entire configuration with a completely new configuration. So this is like swapping good config or sorry, bad config for good config. 
And then we have something that we're probably more traditionally used to, which is the merge, where you're just inserting a, a small change, which could be an ACL, an interface, BGP, something like that, single kind of changes, you know? Something like that. Which one do you use? It's personal opinion. Your mileage is going to vary from mine. My best advice is, if you own the entire running configuration from beginning to end, use the replace. If you don't own the configuration and you're only responsible for interfaces, ACLs, routing protocols, or security, use the merge. The replace is nice, and the reason I like using the replace is because you're eliminating that snowflake in your network. If somebody one, one time sneaks in and does a little bit of their ninja skills with their CLI and makes some cheeky little changes when you're not expecting it, the next time you do a configuration replace, as we'll see in a bit, it's going to jump out at you really, really quick. And it'll destroy that configuration. It'll, it will take that out. You can get, when you're doing the changes, a configuration compare. And you can compare your new proposal configuration file with the running configuration file. So before you make that change and commit it, you can actually see the change. So it sits kind of pending in the session, waiting to be committed. Like you would when I mentioned an XR device where you type commit and it pushes it from uh, the starter configuration into the running configuration, for example or vice versa, you will be able to see that. So you'll be able to validate the changes. When you're using configuration replace, that comes pretty much as a standard. It will print that diff for you. With the merge, you do have to use the uh, a diff syntax within the Napalm Python library to do that. But when, whatever I'm doing, whether I am doing the merge or I'm doing the conf, uh, configuration, I like to see that. And it's called the get diff. Let's look at part two. Have you ever made a change and it was the wrong change? Or it's taken something out that you didn't expect to go out? You've made a change and then you're... There's, 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 a, there's a guy nodding there. <laughs> yeah, I'm right with you, brother. You made that change and then all of a sudden your monitoring lights up like a Christmas tree. And that gets your manager's attention pretty quick. You want to be able to revert that. You want to be able to revert that configuration file. You want to be able to revert that changes. And I've seen so many times when people are doing automation, it's that they plan the rollout, but they don't plan the fallback. And for me, the rollback is just as important as the rollout, if not more important. Because if you are rolling back something, it's, you want to be able to do it quick, and you want to be able to do it accurately. And here, we are provided with that. We are able to just roll that back. And we're able to do that with the rollback command within Napalm. I talked a little bit about this on the last slide about the commit. You can write the line in there so you have to type commit. This could be for the merge, or it can be used in, in the, well, it can be used in both, both the merge and the full replace. So you do your change, you eyeball the change that looks good, commit. You can then check that and then do the discard and roll back if you wanted to. Oh, here we go. Roll back. You can then roll back that, roll that back. Sorry, I apologize. Let me go back to discard again. Discard means that instead of committing, you will actually push that change. My apologies. Discard would mean that you eyeball the changes, it doesn't look right, so you don't actually push it. You've got the session hanging on the device, it's connected, but then you back those changes out and the device is never committed. So it doesn't actually happen. And then the rollback, like I say, takes it back to the previous commit. Okay. We talked about configuration. Let's talk about data information gathering. Because this becomes a kind of a daily task. How many times you're asked to gather all this information, you're asked to gather stuff. So there I am, I'm sat there, enjoying myself, having a nice day at work, and I'm asked to collect the versions or 
I'm asked to find out the SNMP community strings or something on all of our devices globally. There was a time once that I could log in and do this really quickly. But then when it comes to 200 devices, 300 devices, 500 devices, and it's a five o'clock on a Friday evening, I don't think there's a person here that would go, hey, yeah, don't worry, I'll stay and do it. You know, you know when something's going wrong because someone's coming up to you with pizza on a Friday because they want something. So what we do is we send the get request and we send that to the running configuration and that provides the details back to us. What we do with those details is entirely up to us. We could put them into a file, we could send them into Google Drive, or we could just plainly look at them on the screen, or we could do all three. My boss could say to me, I need to know whether we're running this particular version. I can pull all that information, write it to an Excel file from all those devices and just send him that file. And then he can stay the extra hour on a Friday and look through the Excel file. The other one which is really nice is the kind of compliance reporting here. And here what I want to do is I want to actually generate some information and I want to compare this to the expected to what's on the running. So I have an idea like a QA session, I want to audit my ACLs. I and mean, if I'm comparing that full merge configuration back to my running configuration, if I have no difference between what I expect in my source control and what's on the running configuration of the device, then that should come back and show me no diffs, right? And we could write that into the merge, but we get it by default through the replace. And that's the great thing about the unified API here, is that we're able to then compare the expected versus the running. And we're able to push that back and see those changes. Remember when I spoke about snowflakes a little bit before? If somebody did go in there, do the little cheeky little thing, just to get around, you know, solve SREs complaining or something? I made that change, I'd spot that straight away. And then we'd be able to know when that configuration was put in there in the change diff. So when we look at uh, deployment and operations, we did talk about the, um, the merge. And this is how the merge works. Looking deeper into this, this is how it actually works. We take our code from our device and we run this because this is, I guess, agentless is the term, from our machine. And then we generate the candidate configuration. And then we either use the merge or the replace feature to actually, see, uh, actually push those changes to our device. Then we get the option there to either commit it or discard it. Do we want to make those changes or don't we want to make those changes? Personally, I still like to eyeball a lot of my changes. I like to see those things that I'm pushing towards it. And if I've got five changes in a day, do I push those out in one big change or do I push them out as single increment changes? I kind of like the single increment changes and not big blocks, but that's my own personal preference. I might push out a new interface, I might push out some new uh, prefix or OSPF, I might push out something for BGP, and I'll push those out incrementally across as I go. So we've talked about it a lot. Now we want to see it. So this is where we have to uh, do the live demo. OK. Let me just make that a bit bigger. Oops. Do, do, do. Can you all see that at the back? Come closer. We won't bite. OK. So well, what the first thing I want to do here, I want to start, I'm going to show you first getting the information back. If you're new to automation and you're just getting into it and stuff, the first things you want to do is start retrieving information. That's usually the first task. So here. I'm just going to run this. And just for information, I am running this on a, um, a Vagrant device, or an X XE device, which is running here on my laptop. Here's my, here's my device. Let me log back in there. So that's running on localhost. Oops. Oh, I know. 
There we go. So I'm just running this on a, a simple device. So what I'm doing is I'm just saying pay, uh, Python, napalm, get facts, and I want to get the facts about the device. I always tend to use args pass. And the reason I tend to do that, and I've done that for a long time, is I don't hard code things like um, IP addresses and things into my code. Generally, as a rule, I have a, a CMDB database or IP blocks or something like that, an IPAM, which holds it. So instead of specifying a, a local host here, I would specify my router device name. This also enables me to chain devices together to per data center or split them down into regions if I'm making changes as well. So I could say XR devices US or something like that. The code is smart enough to go back to the CMDB database and pick out the ones that have the uh, US as the location or the geolocation. But I could pull this down to more. I could pull this down to XE as well or XR. So you could just limit this into different groups all the way through. So let me run this. And let's see what happens. OK, that's interesting. There's a couple of things with a couple of different platforms that you have to enable. And the nice thing about Napalm is, if it is a platform command that you need to put on that device, it's going to tell you what that command is to enable this to work. And so here it says I have to go onto the um, XR device and configure the uh, XML agent TTY alliteration off. So let's do that now. I'm just going to copy this. It's really difficult doing it over your shoulder. So let's go onto our box. Oops. OK. I'm going to commit that. Let me end out of there. OK. Now I'm going to run that again. Nice. So what it tells me is, is that vendor, OS version, host name, uptime, and the, and the basic interfaces on the device. But to get that information to look like that, you do have to use a little bit of Python foo. Um, so let me show you what we, it would look like if I use just the raw output here. Or let it go to its default, should I say. Because that one that I was using was napalm get facts. I want to use napalm get facts underscore plain. Oops, let me just remove that extension. There. OK. So if you don't do any parsing or any formatting of it, this is what it looks like. OK. So we just print it out straight away like that. So it's a little hard to read on the eyes, especially if you're pulling a bigger configuration out. But you can see how the data is then formatted. And then what you can do is, with Python, you can go through and you can pick out possibly the information that you need and print that out with tabula, or you could print it out with pretty tables or something like that. You could extract that information and put it into whatever format that you needed because it's coming the way that it's coming back, the way that Napalm is abstracting that data. So let me show you what that looks like in Atom. This is the plane. And this is what the full running code looks like. So here, we import the Napalm library, and we import the driver. I spoke a little bit about args pass here. And I'm passing the args pass from 15 to 18. But the code itself here, I'm getting the network driver. And in this case, I've hard-coded in as XR. I've passed in my username and passwords. If there's any security people in the audience now, again, a bit twitchy. You can actually secure this securely, or you can have your own SSH keys as well. Because I'm running this in Vagrant and I'm doing a port forward, I've specified the port. Normally, we'd use uh, 22, so I'm forwarding 22 to 2221. I'm putting in the device IP from the args. Firstly, I open the device. I then get the facts from the device, and this is the syntax from Napalm, device, get facts. 
I then close the device because I'm a nice guy, and then I print those facts out. And you don't, you want to close all your sessions, it will time out eventually, but I have seen ones where too many people have got in and the sort of TTY lines are kind of backed up. So it's always a good job to be plain. And now if I show you just the printed version, oops, let's have a look, print, facts. Pretty much the same all the way through, printing that Napalm is running, and then I'm just printing that out in a more friendlier format on the eyes. So I can see it and we can read it. OK. Let me go back here. So the next one that I want to show you, we've seen how to get information back from the devices. And we can change that get, get from get interfaces to, uh, oh, sorry, get facts to get interfaces. And there's a whole bunch of getters out there which will get that information back. Napalm comes built in with around about, I would say, 20 get requests from interfaces to BGP to LD, LLDP and that kind of stuff. But if there isn't a get command that you want to retrieve that information back, you can actually push CLI commands to the box. And a great example of that is that if you've got a TAC case open, what's the first thing TAC asks you to do? They say, give me a list of show commands. And they're usually about this long. So you've got a choice. Log into the box, show this, show that, show, show, show. You can write the script with Napalm, push those show commands to it, and have it write it all back as a text file. So instead of spending a couple of hours going through the show commands and listing them all out and putting them in a text file for TAC, you can use Napalm to log into your devices or multiple devices and pull all those show information or show commands back. Word of warning from experience, the only one you cannot push a show uh, command from is the admin command in XR. You will get an error. So you know where you have admin show in XR? You can't do that via the CLI command. You still have to go in there raw to get that. But I believe that's the design from Cisco to stop automation from running in to get that. So the next thing that I want to do after we've um, got devices, we've got all of our information back, I want to start making configuration changes. So the thing that I want to do is I want to put some more IP addresses on my, on my device. So the one that I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to do napalm loopbacks. And what this will do is it'll push a bunch of, it'll put, put a bunch of new um, loopback devices on our, on our box. Let me hop over to the box uh, again. Okay. How many? Okay. We've only got the management interface on there. That's good. So I'm going to push this out there. And then we'll take a look and see how this works. So we see Napalm is running. And now you can see that diff that we spoke about. You can see the little plus signs on this left-hand side here that I'm actually adding these interfaces and these IP addresses. You'll notice that it doesn't put a plus next to this line here. You get a little bit of extra come through from the diff that it's pulling back from the device, but you can see the pluses. And here, I have the commit, configuration, or hit enter to a abort. When we talked about the discard earlier, I'm just describing that as a abort. But what I've done is, I've actually made this quite difficult on myself. I've actually asked for commit to be typed in capital letters, rather than just whack in on return. Because it is just too easy just to whack return right away and push those changes out. I can eyeball my changes, type commit, and we see conf uh, config is committed. The code has come back and told me you're, you're committed. So I'm going to jump back onto my box. I'm going to hit the up arrow. And now we see the loopbacks have been pushed to the device. OK. So now we're able to make configuration changes. And how did I do that? Let's go back to Atom again. Napalm loopbacks. 
We're familiar with imports now, we're familiar with this, we're familiar with right down to line 25. But this is where we start to see the changes. Let me just scoot down a bit more there. Okay. Now see if I can get all of this on the screen. Perfect. So we see right at the top there that we're opening the connection to the device. We are then doing the merge configuration. And you can see that on line 31. And I'm pushing in a file called new underscore loopback CFG. And that's how I've decided to put that in there. I'm just taking a file with that command on there, and I'm pushing it to the device as the example. You could be using all kinds of things to do this, from templates to raw text to anything to actually do this. The configuration pretty much remains the same, how you're doing this. I'm then taking a look at the diffs. And remember at the start, we said that the merge doesn't come with the diffs, and only the replace does? Here, I'm actually asking for that, because I do want to see the diffs myself before I do it. And then we get this down to the commit. I wrote a little bit of error handling in there as well, just in case there's some errors with the commit. So this is a great idea that if your syntax is invalid, you want to get something back. You don't want your Python script just to balk. You'd like to get some information back of why that error has occurred. You might have some spaces. Believe me, when I had some spaces in template, and I had a space on a template, that was four hours of my life I'm never going to get back, all because I didn't put that in there. Else print committed. If I aborted it, you would see that it was there. I've got something interesting here, though, on line 56. Print no changes needed. If that happens, discard. OK. Let me go back to here. Now, let me run this again. And what do we think is going to happen? No change is needed. Because what we've done is we've compared the commands that we're wanting to put to the device to what's on our running configuration. We've compared the two together, and there's no changes to be made. So that is automatically then discarded. OK. The next one I want to do is we've looked at the merge now. Now let's see the replace. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a full replace of the configuration. So we go back into here. Uh, OK. And now what I'm doing is I'm taking a completely different running configuration file. I'm pushing it to that device, and we're going to replace it. You'll have to excuse the formatting on this version of uh, Vagrant that I'm running. The diff comes back a little bit funky on the left-hand side. But what it means here is this is the original device. 1.1.1.100 1 is being replaced by this. I'm not using any form of no command or delete. When doing that full replace, if you wanted to do this, where you'd have to go in and say, no, I don't want this, and I want this, what will happen is this will get overwritten. And that new configuration file, the good one, will replace what I'm going to consider now the bad one with the interface addresses here. So I get the chance to commit this again. OK. Config committed. Right. Let's jump over to Atom again. And take a look at this. And this should be coming really, be, becoming really familiar now. Let's skip over these lines. And you'll see here on line 30, the first change that we have, instead of doing load merge, we do load replace. And it's as simple as that, to replace. And I'm replacing this. However, I am using a .conf file. If you are using replace, the best thing to do is use a .conf file. When you SCP your original template off your device, if you save it as a .conf file, it will make it so much easier to start doing full replaces. We then compare that. We print the diffs. We get the option, do we want to commit this? Am I making the right choice here? Or do I want to discard it? 
we have the abort, and then of course, if I was to run this again, we would see there's no changes needed. If I jump over to the conf file, and it's here, you can see the loopbacks, and when I said we don't have to do a delete, we don't have to do a no, there's my new loopbacks with the third octet ending in 100 and 200 respectively. There is no no command in there. I'm just replacing the entire lot. So this was great. Let's say someone made that snowflake in there. They got my mask wrong. I could just revert that, go straight over there. Don't have to go in with the CLI. Don't have to do a no. I can just push that configuration out from my template once more, and it will correct the mistake that was made. OK, finally, this LA, there we go. I want to do, so now, let's say, for example, that those loopbacks were wrong. And I wanted them to go back. I wanted them to be um, one in the third octet not 100 in the third octet. Let's say I made a little typo there, wasn't feeling too well, my catch just died, wasn't feeling good. What I want to do is I want to roll this back. Uh, napalm, not maypalm. Uh, napalm dot loopbacks dot rollback. OK. So now I want to change those interfaces back again. Cool, we see the diff, much more cleaner this time. And we're changing back. We've got the negative here and the positive here, which means we're going to roll back um, the IP addresses there on the third octagon. OK, we're good. Now I want to commit that. OK. But then I realize I made a mistake. Actually, it, it, um, it was 100 I wanted in the third octet. It wasn't one. OK. Let me go over to my command here. I've committed this to the device, remember. Show IP in brief. There we go. So you see the difference, one in the th third octet, and I've gone and broken something. And I want to roll this back now. I want, to, I, I, want, I, want to, I want to roll this back. So I can roll this back. And here, I can type roll back to revert the changes or hit enter to abort. So let's roll it back. Configuration reverted. OK, OK. My services are coming back online now. Let's go into here. And we're back again. And now we've got 100 in the third octet again. And we've reverted those changes. So that's, um, that's pretty powerful stuff. We can roll back those changes. Obviously, in XR and in the Juniper devices, we do have that ability to roll back. So one of the questions we often get is, well, can you do this in iOS? Can you do this in XE? Yeah, you can. That's called the archive feature. And you can enable the archive feature. And by default, that will keep a snapshot of the running configuration. And it will keep 10 of them in the flash drive. So you can then start doing rollbacks on XE and, um, and iOS, which is pretty cool. And you can do it on Nexus as well. The way that you do it on Nexus is creating a checkpoint. You have to enable the checkpoint, and you create that checkpoint. And then you're able to roll back your configurations in exactly the same manner that we did just now. So that's cool. OK, back to the slides. Actually, let me just show you the code for that quickly. So how did I do that? Uh, I got up to here. This is all good now. You're all experts. Everybody's good with this. Uh, no, it's the wrong one. Do, 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 this one, sorry. That. I, am using, I did use the merge for that one to show you the rollback. I could have used the replace. I chose to use the merge. So let's go all the way down here. 
And that command you see now on line 68, that's as easy as it gets. A unified API will give you that across multiple devices and multiple platforms. And you're able to roll back those changes quite quickly. And you can also print the error with there. I mentioned I was printing a few errors on there. If the rollback that I was changing, for instance, was not going to work, this is that would pretty much sort it out. OK. Back to the slides. So how do you contribute to this? Napalm is an open stack, uh, open source, sorry, um, Python library, which means they have a really, really great Git repo. If you've got a problem, you can go onto the Git repo, create a, uh, create a poll on there, and you can contribute to it. I'm in the Network to Code Slack forum for, for Napalm. I'm regularly on there just chatting to people. And you can fix bugs, typos, Im and improve the core and improve the plugins. Someone was on there talking the other day saying, have you got a driver for HP? And one of the, um, one of the devs on there from, from Napalm said, no. But if you want to create one, you can, which is great, which means if you want to put in that little bit of work and create your own drivers for devices which aren't natively or built in supported by Napalm, you can create your own drivers. And then you can add that to the community. And that's what I like about the community. If you want to get all of this code that I've showed you today, you can download it from uh, Cisco Developer forward slash code exchange. It's under the uh, title, I believe I called it, uh, CLI, or sorry, CLER, and then the, um, the workshop name. So it's easy to find on there. And you can bring that code down. And you can use that on any of the sandboxes. If you wanted to use it on your Nexus devices or your iOS devices, just change the driver in the code and it will work. If you ever get stuck with driver commands or anything like that, the best thing to look at, can I get Chrome there? Uh, there you go, is Napalm's documentation. And there's plenty of stuff in there. The documentation is pretty cool. There's loads of stuff in there. We looked at the support matrix. And then if you look a little bit further down, you will see some of the things that you can have, like the rollback and things like that. But you can see the majority is supported across the board. So it's supported on a bunch of different flavors. So just to review, we looked at how I started with uh, APIs and how I'm getting so much more sleep now, hence this beautiful complexion you see before you. We looked at the hopes, goals, and dreams that I talked about, about managing my network from a CLI onto an automated platform. Oops, wrong slide. And then we looked at Napalm. We looked at the platform support, installation, the usage, the when and where, getting information and doing changes uh, that we saw in the demo. And can you contribute to this? Yes, you can. It's open source. So we can all contribute to this. If you've got any questions, please feel free. More than open to take questions via any of these methods. All the code and stuff that you'll see me demo in throughout all of Cisco Live is on my own repository. You can reach out to me on Twitter or my email or WebEx Teams. And I'd encourage you to follow Cisco DevNet on our Facebook, our GitHub, and our Twitter account. We're very active. Anything that I'm posting on there is fair game. There's a beautiful picture of me in a boat there, and I'm looking to it to the future in my Viking heritage. It's a pretty poor boat, though, isn't it? I need a pay rise. OK, I'm going to be in the WebEx team for the session for the next 20 days asking questions. I can direct you to the sandboxes or the code if you can't find them. Please reach out if you've got any questions in there. And if you get the chance, please come read the survey. The, today for all the Cisco Live here. It really helps with the feedback and helps us improve the sessions. There's no such thing as negative feedback. There's no such thing as good feedback for me. It's just feedback. Unless you criticize my beard and then I'll. <laughs> OK, continue education with Cisco and all the different labs that we've got running on today. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>